Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Deep Penetration Podcast. My name is Danny, and today we are tackling a topic that is often shrouded, right, in this kind of blanket of silence and stigma. That was so extra of an entrance, but whatever, go with it. I like a little visualization every once in a while. Um, And we're talking about sexual health, right, amongst gay and bisexual men. And this episode is titled Dirty Little Gay Secret, the Unspoken Truth About Sexual Health Amongst Gay and Bisexual Men. So sexual health um, is, in my opinion, an essential aspect of overall well-being. Yet there are there are so many misconceptions and and issues within our community that need to be addressed. So let us dive right into that. The first thing um, that I want to talk about are some common misconceptions regarding sexual health amongst gay and bi men. So what are some of these common misconceptions that we hear and that we see? The first one is that HIV is no longer a threat. And here's the truth. I am not an expert on HIV, um, but I do spend a lot of time researching reading reports, and having open discussions with men within the LGBTQ plus community about their sexual health. And there seems to be this idea that HIV is no longer a real threat due to advancements in treatments um, that have made HIV more manageable, but it is still a significant concern, right? So new infections continue to occur and staying informed about prevention is super, super important. Important. The second thing here is that PrEP eliminates all risk. PrEP, if you don't know what it stands for, is pre-expo- pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's highly effective in preventing HIV. Um, studies and clinical trials have shown that PrEP can reduce the risk of contracting HIV by 99%. However, there is always a risk of contracting HIV, even if you are on PrEP. So in order for it to be effective, you have to make sure that you are taking it as prescribed. But here's the thing. PrEP does not prevent you from contracting STIs. Um, So regular STI testing is super important or essential even for those of you who are on PrEP. PrEP also comes with its fair share of side effects. So while PrEP is generally safe and it's effective, it can have some potential side effects and health risks. So what are some of the the common side effects here? Um, One of them is is, uh, nausea, and gastrointestinal issues. Um, And some people might experience diarrhea, abdominal pain, and cramping when they first start PrEP. Um, But the truth, but the symptoms themselves um, will often resolve after like a few weeks. Um, There's the potential for, for kidney health issues, right? PrEP can affect your kidneys functions. So regular monitoring of your kidneys um, health is recommended. Um, And most people do not experience significant kidney problems, but it's important to have periodical kidney tests done while you are on PrEP. That is definitely something that my doctor advised to me um, when I went on PrEP. I also experienced the the heavy gastrointestinal symptoms as well. It was a doozy, let me tell you. Um, There's also bone density, right? So there is some evidence that suggests that long-term use of PrEP might affect bone density, although um, it's it's usually not severe, um, but regular monitoring um, that can help manage those potential issues is going to be very, very important. There's also drug interactions, right? And that's the case, I think, with any kind of medication. Um, PrEP can interact with certain types of medication, so it's important that you discuss all the medications that you are taking and the supplements that you are taking with your healthcare provider if you plan on getting on PrEP. There's also the risk for allergic reactions. that can occur. And I think that's the case with most medications, right? There's always the risk of having some kind of allergic reaction. The other one here that is not often discussed is risk compensation. So what does this mean? So even though PrEP is highly effective, it does not prevent against other sexually transmitted infections, like I was saying earlier, right? So STIs um, or or for for women, if you are on PrEP, unintended pregnancies, right? Some of you may engage um, in riskier behavior, assuming that you are fully protected. And 
it's very important to, to have regular follow-up appointments with your healthcare provider to monitor the side effects and to ensure that medication that the medication is working the way that it's intended. But again, um, increasing your risk for contraction of STIs and STDs can be a factor here because of that mentality that, oh, well, I'm on PrEP, so I'm completely protected. I don't have to worry about it. Please do not have that mentality. It is really important for you to still understand that there are risks involved here. The third thing um, is that, and we're talking about the common misconceptions here, um, right, is that monogamous relationships don't require STI testing. Even in monogamous relationships, initial STI testing and periodic retesting is essential, if you ask me. Why? Some infections can go undetectable because they can be asymptomatic for years. So regular health checks is really important. There's also the variable of infidelity here, right? Cheating. I have worked with many clients that have contracted STIs from their partners because they cheated and kept it a secret. Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying this to, to, um, inst to uh, plant a seed of doubt in your relationship or in your partner or any of those things, I'm merely stating the risk factors here and why it is important to still prioritize testing even if you are in a monogamous relationship. The fourth common misconception here is that oral sex is safe sex. Girl, um, oral sex can still transmit, as, uh, transmit STIs. Um, you can get gonorrhea, you can get syphilis, you can get herpes. So Using barriers like condoms or dental dams during oral sex can reduce the risk of transmission. And listen, before the mob comes for me, I know that the the reality is that most of you are not going to wrap it up um, before putting it in your mouth or in somebody else's mouth, okay? Um, <laughs> I get it. I understand. Um, it takes away from like the sexiness of the moment, um, and it can totally be um, a mood killer, right? And I speak from experience with this, considering that I was not using dental dams or condoms when I came, when it came to oral sex. So I get it, Ma. God, I hope my mom is not listening to this episode. Um, but even if she's listening to this episode, surprise, Mom. <laughs> Me and my mom have a really close relationship, and we talk about a lot of things like this anyway. So it would not be um, something that's super shocking to her, but I really hope my partner's mom is not listening to this. <sighs> Cover your ears. Um, here's the thing. Um, I did pay the price. Real talk. I did pay the price. I remember I contracted three STIs in a two-month period, um, and my body went through the ringer, let me tell you. I ended up having reoccurring mononucleosis, which resulted in other health issues that I'm still dealing with today, um, resulted in um, chronic inflammation in my body and, and all these different things because everything went haywire, right? And I think it was also co coupled with the fact that I, I, I had the flu and then I contracted an STI and then that converted into mono and it was just kind of like my body was just getting, <laughs> I was going to say rammed, but I was like, I don't know if that's appropriate for, or maybe it is because it kind of is relatable to what we're talking about. My body just got destroyed, right? So if you are going to randomly hook up with somebody, even if it's just oral, make sure that they have been recently tested. And I know that this does not eliminate the possibility of contracting something, but it reduces the risk. Um, next, I want to dive into some important health facts and practices that every gay and bi man should, bi man should be aware of. The first one, and this is kind of piggybacking off of what I was talking about, um, or barebacking off of what I was talking about, um, is regular STI testing. So it is recommended to get tested for STIs every three to six months. Every three to six months. Every three to six months. Do I need to say it again? Every three to six months. E, if you are sexually active, right? Um, so this includes getting tested for HIV, for syphilis, for gonorrhea, for chlamydia, for hepatitis. Um, and here's a tip. 
make it a routine to get tested with your partner or your friends because it can kind of help to reduce that that like stigma um, and encourage regular checkups, right? There are many places that you can get tested. You can get tested by your medical provider, so your PCP. You can get tested at an LGBTQ plus center. You can get tested at mobile test centers. There is out-of-the-closet stores that do um, testing, so check any locations for out-of-the-closet stores if you have them in your area. There is city uh, funded testing facilities. You can go to a Quest Diagnostic and get tested. There are many, many, many um, places that you can that you have access to to be able to do that. Um, the second thing here is vaccinations, right? So vaccines for hepatitis A, for hepatitis B, as well as HPV, human papillomavirus. If you're not familiar with it, are crucial um, in preventing infections long term. And here's a tip. Check with your healthcare provider to, to make sure that your vaccines are up to date when it comes to um, STIs and all of those things. I want to clarify something. Um, when it comes to the subject of vaccines, I know that it is a hot button topic for a lot of people and it is very triggering for people because of everything that we experienced um, during the disease that shall not be named, um, or the virus that shall not be named. I get it. I understand. The decision to get vaccinated is yours. So if you choose to get vaccines for for certain viruses and those kinds of things, fantastic, great, you are protected against it. If you choose not to, that is also your call. I am not here to tell you what is right and what is wrong. That is just my stance on it. And if you don't like that, sorry, so be it. The third one is PrEP, right? Um, and PEP. So PrEP is, and, and we've talked about this, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but it's a daily pill that significantly re reduces the risk of HIV infection. Um, and then there's also PEP. So PEP is, so while PrEP is pre, um, wait, we're going to have to cut this. Can you hear that in the mic? Okay. Can't hear it? Okay. Great. Anyways, um, sorry, there's thunder. So I was just clarifying. So I don't know, maybe we'll keep this in the podcast episode, whatever. <laughs> it's real and raw and organic. Um, so while PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's technically considered like an emergency medication taken after the potential exposure to HIV. So if you think that you have been exposed to HIV, um, PEP must be started within 72 hours. So you have to contact your health or healthcare provider immediately so that you can get started on that right away. The fourth thing here is safe sex practices, right? So using condoms consistently and correctly is one of the most effective ways to prevent STIs and HIV. So if you want, here's a pro tip, you combine using a condom with PrEP for added protection against HIV. And look, again, like I said, I understand that for some people, not a thing. Don't want to wear condoms or or any of that. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to say that you are making a wrong decision. That is completely your choice. My thing here is ensure that you are doing that with somebody who consents to that as well. So if the two of you guys have agreed to go without protection, great. That is a decision that the two of you guys as adults have made together. Have fun, have at it and do your thing. Um, do not pressure somebody into having sex with you without protection if it is something that they are not comfortable with. That is not okay. That is never okay in my book. And the reason why I say that, and I might be a little bit triggered about this, is because in a previous episode, I talked about my experience with um, um, ASA, right? So adult sexual assault. And in that situation, um, during intimacy with this person, um, they removed the protection without telling me and finished inside of me without me understanding what was going on or really knew what happened. Um, so please make sure that you are having that conversation with the person that you are planning on hooking up with, that you are engaging with sexually to make sure that they are okay um, doing it without protection. And if they're not okay doing it without protection and it's something that you really, really want, then maybe it's you need to move on from that situation and find somebody else who is. Don't pressure somebody into that. Um, 
went off a little tangent there, but that's okay. So let's address some some stigmas, right, and some mental health issues related to sexual health. So the first stigma uh, is around HIV and STIs, right? So many people still face stigma and shame regarding these specific um, things, which can prevent you from seeking testing or treatment. So open conversations and education can really help to reduce the stigma, right? Normalize regular testing and discussing sexual sexual health with your partner. Normalize having that conversation with your friends. Normalize having that conversation with in the community so that there isn't this this heavy stigma that's attached to it, right? The second thing here is mental health. And, and sexual health, you know, sexual health and mental health are closely linked. So anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem can impact sexual behaviors and vice versa. Um, so what do I mean by this? Somebody who is depressed or anxious or lonely might um, partake in risky sexual behaviors. They may want to, to connect with more people because there's that need for validation, and that can increase your risk of, of transmitting disease, uh, vice versa, right? So maybe if you are are the type of individual that when you're depressed, you don't want to be around people, and you don't want to be, you don't want to see people, that can reduce your risk of contracting sexually transmitted diseases because you're not being sexual with people. It really just kind of matters on who you are as a person and how you handle your mental health. But the two are are connected. They're linked. They can they can play off of each other, right? Let's put it that way. And finally, um, I want to talk about some resources available for support um, for you guys when it comes to this specific topic. So the first one is healthcare providers, right? I would recommend finding LGBTQ plus friendly healthcare providers who are knowledgeable about gay and bisexual men's health. Um, there are websites like GLMA. If you have not heard of it before, it's Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, and that can help you to locate inclusive providers. I will provide you with all that information in the description down below as well. There's also community organizations, right? So reach out to your local LGBTQ plus organization for support, um, for testing services, and even for educational resources, right? So organizations like the Trevor project. Um, there's the GMHC um, and your local LGBTQ plus centers as well. So again, if you're not familiar with these resources, I will make sure to provide you with the information down below. There's also online resources, right? So you can utilize online platforms um, for information. So there's websites like the CDC, there's Planned Parenthood, there's AIDS.gov, uh, and they all offer relatable information when it comes to sexual health. All right. Thank you for tuning into the Deep Penetration Podcast. I hope you found this episode to be helpful. I know this was far more like straight educational when it comes to sex health, but I think it's really important for the conversation to be had, especially if you are somebody who is not super familiar with the conversation or uncomfortable having the conversation. Um, I hope that this provides a bit of a resource for you. Um, so if you found it helpful, please make sure you subscribe, share, and leave a comment down below. Uh, let's continue to educate and support each other on these subjects. I will see you in the next video.